Hello, welcome back to Kirsty's virtual classroom. Today we're talking all about volcanoes, so let's get started. So volcanoes are formed from magma. So there has to be some sort of magma source in order for a volcano to form. And when this magma comes to the surface, it's then considered lava. So it starts as magma below the surface. Once it breaches the surface and comes out onto the surface or of the crust of the earth, then we call it lava. That lava then cools and turns into solid rock. Okay, so lava is what forms igneous rocks, which is the first type of rock that we are going to talk about in this class. There are different types of rocks that are formed from different types of lavas. So depending on the composition of the lava, you're going to see a different type of rock. And the composition of the lava is also controlled by the viscosity. So the viscosity of a lava is the ease of the flow of the lava. So however easy the material can flow, that decreases the viscosity. So this is measured by something called silica, which we talked about a little bit with um, minerals. So silica is one of the most abundant elements on Earth, and that controls the viscosity of a lava. So the more silica there is, the more viscous a fluid will be, or a more viscous lava will form. And so it'll be kind of stickier in a sense. So consider um, honey versus mayonnaise for instance so if you pour honey that is not you know really cold it's like at room temperature i'm talking about fresno room temperature by the way um so it's fairly warm you pour honey out on the table it's going to flow pretty pretty easily and then if you pour mayonnaise on the table what do you think is going to happen it's just going to kind of plop in one spot right so it's not going to flow very well so mayonnaise would be a very high viscosity lava if you will and honey would be a very low viscosity lava. Okay. So volcanoes are really important because over time they will produce very, very fertile soil. So as rocks erode and weather, which we'll talk about in the next two videos um, with sedimentary rocks and weathering, um, they form into really, really rich soils. So these fertile soils are really important for people that have developed farmlands and crops around volcanoes, which is really good for their um, development of their community, but it's really also kind of a negative thing if the volcano is not dormant, it can still erupt again, and then all of those people would be in harm's way. Take Naples, Italy, for example. They are right up against this volcano, and if it ever erupts again, um, which is Mount Vesuvius, um, it will, disrupt and displace a lot of people in addition to potentially killing a lot of people. Um, so volcanoes are a really important um, topic of interest for geologists because they're not just scientifically interesting, they're also really important for the development and continuation of our society. Okay, so as we've learned with plate tectonics so far, that wherever we see plates, plate boundaries, we're going to see volcanoes as well. So this is the Pacific Ring of Fire, which is where most of the volcanoes on Earth are located around the Pacific Plate. Now there are other earthquakes, or sorry, um, other volcanoes on different parts of the world, um, but most of them are congregated around this Pacific Ring of Fire. Okay, so getting into the different types of volcanoes, we have three basic types. We have shield, composite strato, and caldera. Okay, so shield are very passive eruptions. They don't have a lot of explosions. You don't see the big dust cloud or ash cloud go up into the sky. They're very passive. We'll talk about some examples in a minute. Composite strato volcanoes are explosive eruptions, and then caldera are what we consider catastrophic eruptions. So they are the largest eruptions we see on Earth. So starting with shield volcanoes, this is an example of what one would look like. So these are generally broad and very gent, gentle sloping. So you don't have that very iconic volcano shape with these volcanoes. Um, and the Hawaiian Islands are an example of this. So they have very passive eruptions. They just kind of spew out lava here and there. And the lava flow um, generally will 
fan out because of the low viscosity. So shield volcanoes have a very low viscosity and a very low silica content. So because they have a low silica, they have a low viscosity, and they don't have very eruptive or explosive eruptions. Okay, so that's what's controlling the eruptive style. The stickier the lava, the harder it is for it to move. So if it's hard for the volcano to move the lava, it's going to end up with a very explosive eruption. So because the lava is really easy to move in shield volcanoes, it just kind of flows out. And most of the rock that comes from shield volcanoes is known as basalt. Okay. So Hawaii, like I said, is a very popular shield volcano. Um, and it has a couple, obviously. It's not just one centralized volcano. Um, and Mauna Kea is the largest structure on Earth. It's taller um, than the Himalayas. So, um, but that's from its base, okay? So um, it's 10 kilometers from the ocean base to its peak, which is pretty high. But as far as magma volume that has been produced, um, Mauna Loa has produced the most um, magma of any of the volcanoes <clears throat> on the Hawaiian island. Um, the most active right now is Kilauea, which is down over in the southern, um, southeastern portion of the big island. Kilauea has had quite a few eruptions in the last 30 years or so. Um, this is from one of the May 1990 eruptions. So you can see it interacting here with brush, and you can tell that it quickly turns to fire. So when lava flows hit brush, which is very popular on the Hawaiian Islands, um, it generally turns into fire, so it causes an extra hazard rather than just the lava flow. It's now things are on fire. Kilauea also dumps lava into the ocean, which can be a very spectacular, beautiful view. Um, but one of the really cool scientific things is the rock cools really fast. And because it cools really fast, it gives us this really nice, smooth texture. Here is one of Kilauea's most recent eruptions in 2018. This one is a little bit more rough. So the lava here is not as hot as it is in some of these other pictures. So here you can kind of see it almost liquid, right? And here it looks a little bit rougher. And that's um, because the temperature of the magma is not nearly as warm. Um, and that, ha that can be dependent on a number of different things. Um, time since last eruption, um, the mobility of the lava. Um, here it wasn't moving very quickly, um, so a crust was starting to form. So you can kind of see that on the surface here. A crust was forming on the lava um, before it continued moving forward. So in Hawaii, we have two different types of lava. We see an a'a lava and a pahoehoe lava. And the a'a -a lava is very rough. So it's like the last picture I showed you where it's kind of forming a crust. And so the rock becomes very bumpy. Whereas in a pahoehoe lava, it's very rope-like and smooth. So pahoehoe means rope-like and a'a -a means rough. Okay, and those are both Hawaiian words. Okay, some other volcanic hazards you might see with shield volcanoes. Mostly gas emissions and lava flows. Those are the two heavy hitters. Like I said, there are fires that can develop, um, but lava flows and gas emissions are the um, most common. Um, and usually, because the lava doesn't move too quickly and the eruption isn't too explosive, most people have enough time to evacuate. Whether they choose to evacuate or not is a totally different story, um, but most people are not in... Um, you know, the areas where the lava is actively flowing, they kind of quarantine off those areas, so to speak, and uh, remove people when they know that lava is kind of coming in this direction. Um, Hawaii is fairly predictable as far as a volcano is concerned, um, so there's not a whole lot of active deaths constantly happening just because the volcano is erupting, um, but because the volcano erupts so much, that kind of aids in their um, preparedness there. All right, moving on to composite stratovolcanoes. These are more your iconic volcano shapes. So they're going to have the cone shape, 
And these are fed by some sort of magma that comes up to the surface and is trying to escape. Right, we've talked a little bit about that with um, plate tectonics and how that works. So these volcanoes <clears throat> usually have steep slopes and usually very explosive eruptions. The rock type that is produced here is andesite, and the cascades are a very good example of this. And I'll show you where the cascades are in a second. Okay, so Mount Etna in Italy is another volcano, not just Vesuvius, but it's another volcano in Italy um, that last erupted in 2013. And the reason I like to show this one is because it has a really amazing photograph um, that shows something really rather kind of cool um, that we don't usually get photographs of. So here you can see the lava kind of coming out of the volcano, right? And there's all of this stuff around it. Um, and a lot of people think that that's ash initially, but what that is is snow. So a lot of these uh, volcanoes are snow capped because they're at such high elevations. And when they're snow capped, um, it becomes an additional hazard because when lava hits snow, what do you think happens? It melts, right? Because it's, the lava is too hot. So when the ice or snow melts, it will start flowing down the mountain and it will flood lower elevation areas. So it would start at this volcano here and just follow any of the streams and drainages from the volcano down towards the lower elevations. Okay, so let's talk about kind of the anatomy of a composite stratovolcano. So this is your iconic volcano that most people will talk about. This is, um, it has a lot of hazards associated, as you can kind of tell from this image, um, and a lot of different things can occur at once, or only some of these things can occur. It really depends on the eruption. So one of the things that can occur is earthquakes. So that's just ground shaking from the magma chamber trying to push against the surface and erupt the material. So earthquakes at a small magnitude will occur. You may have um, things like lava domes that are going to be ejected out of the volcano. They show a lot of these if you've seen the newest Jurassic World, uh, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, they have a lot of these kind of shooting out from that volcano. Um, you will also have an eruptive column of mostly ash and then eventually some ash fall or tephra in the prevailing wind direction. So if you're upwind of the volcano, you're in a good situation because the ash fall will go to the downwind section or um, direction, excuse me. So then we can also have landslides occur because the slope becomes unstable when it's erupting and shaking. So if the rocks are not stable, um, they will give way to a landslide. You might also see pyroclastic flows. So pyroclastic flows are some of this ash in here and some lava. And pyroclastic flows can be really, really dangerous. I'll show you um, another image of those in a second. And then lahars is the last thing that we might see. And those are kind of like mud flows where it's driven by water and it has ash, rock, maybe some fragments of um, soil, trees, any kind of debris. And they usually follow existing streams. And this is where um, the snow cap mountain situation would come into play. So what drives the lahar would be the snow that has melted from the eruption. Okay, so now we're gonna look at some slides of the Mount St. Helens eruption from 1980. So this is what Mount St. Helens looked like prior to 1980, which is um, probably <laughs> not familiar to most of you because you most likely know it as having that giant bowl or dip in it, and that's from this eruption. So let's take a look at these images really quick. So this next <clears throat> image is from, it has a date on here, April 27, 1980. This is when the bulge started to form and scientists started to get a little worried um, that it was going to erupt because this is not normal, as you can tell from this image here. So this will take you through the eruption. Take a look at what happens.
So this eruption is kind of groundbreaking in volcanology because as you see, it is coming out the side of the volcano. So it is a lateral blast instead of a vertical blast. And most of the volcanic eruptions that had been witnessed prior to this eruption were vertical blasts. And this one happened to be lateral. And the reason why is because the release of pressure occurred from a landslide. So as the bulge put pressure on the side of the slope and things started to kind of shake, the material couldn't hold the pressure anymore. And so it released as a landslide. And that's what allowed the material to escape and the eruption to occur. So the landslide is what allowed the Mount St. Helens eruption from 1980 to occur. So here's a diagram of those photographs. So in March of um, 1980, they started to understand that magma started to intrude. They started seeing um, spikes in uh, shaking levels of the volcano and gas emissions. And then in April is when the bulge started showing up. And then in May, we had the lateral blast and then a vertical blast there after that. So it only took maybe about a month, 28 days or so, from the bulge development for, from, to the eruption. So pretty quickly developed. And in that lateral blast, it blew over hundreds of trees. So these all in here are trees that have been blown over. They're up to 100 feet tall. Um, and the lateral blast took all of these out and it just basically looks like grass at this point. Um, but these are all trees that were um, knocked over from the blast. Um, and then this gives you the outline of the blast zones <clears throat> and where all of the flows went from the volcano. Um, and here is the Johnston Ridge Observatory, which is where you can now, it's kind of like a little outlook um, and museum-y um, center that you can learn about the volcano, watch some of the monitoring of it, um, and learn a little bit about the history of it. And it's named after this guy, who is David Johnston. He died in the lateral blast. He was a geologist that was on site monitoring the volcano, and he unfortunately did not make it. Okay, and this is the view from the observatory, um, where you can look at some different screens and things of the monitoring of the volcano um, and take a pretty nice view of Mount St. Helens. So this is the volcano prior to the 1980 eruption. Um, you can see the iconic cone shape of the volcano um, and a lot of trees and vegetation. And this is the same day. So this is the beginning or the morning, sorry. Um, and then this would be the afternoon after the eruption occurred. So it completely changed this landscape from just one eruption. Okay, composite volcano um, also has asphalt associated with it. So this is a very problematic um, hazard because it can last um, or suspend in the air for a number of days. And um, if this gets into your lungs, this is a microscopic view of it, um, it can really wreak havoc on your lungs and cause serious damage or death. This is a picture of a pyroclastic flow. Um, like I said, these are hot ash and molten rock that are coming down the mountain at 100 miles per hour, and they can reach up to 1,000 degrees Celsius. So they're pretty scary and you can't really outrun these. Mud flows and lahars are another hazard of composite stratovolcanoes. So these, like I said, are driven by water and they contain ash, rock, soil, debris, tree, um, pretty much anything else that's in the path of the lahar. And these usually come from the melted snow on the mountain and it flows down existing streams and drainages from the volcano. This is an image of one from the 1980 Mount St. Helens eruption. And that leads to flooding in the lower areas. So the lower elevation areas that are flat is where all that water will collect and it will cause severe flooding. 
So right now in the United States, Mount Rainier in Washington is one of the most potentially dangerous volcanoes because of its proximity to the capital of um, Washington. And it has not erupted in quite some time, but it is said to erupt in the next 20 to 50 years. So here is a hazard map of Mount Rainier. Um, so Tacoma, Washington is here on the northwest side of the map. And Mount Rainier has several drainages leading from its summit. And a lot of them, most of them, <laughs> will lead right down in the Tacoma area. Um, so there will be a very large lahar hazard in the event that Mount Rainier erupts. Calderas are our last type of volcano. So they are very large features and they can create very large craters um, if all of their magma is evacuated. So they form when the magma that's below is released to the surface and then after that release of magma occurs then the material on top collapses into the void space. So the rock type here is rhyolite and Long Valley Caldera in California and Yellowstone are examples. Crater Lake in Oregon is also an example of a caldera or a previous caldera that is no longer, uh, it is now dormant, so it is no longer active right now. And it has formed this very large crater with then filled in with water, creating a lake. Okay, so here's a little um, animation of a caldera formation. So you have magma down here below the surface. And there was our eruption in the background. <laughs> so we have magma here in the chamber. It's escaping through these different vents and erupting out of the, below the surface, out onto the surface. And then eventually this area is void of material. So the material above, the rock above, will collapse in and form the crater. Okay, so talking about what they will produce, some of the things that come out of them. So most of this is going to be ash. Most of the big, big eruptions are mostly ash material. Um, and it's all rhyolite for the most part. Um, it will collapse into the ground once the magma chamber is evacuated and um, they can erupt up to 2,500 cubic kilometers of ash in one eruption, depending on the volcano. And about every 100,000 years, we see one eruption on Earth somewhere. So this is just a diagram of kind of the layout of the Yellowstone caldera. Um, on the surface, this is the outline of the Yellowstone caldera. But as you can see, as you go into the Earth, the caldera is actually much bigger um, than you actually see on the surface. So Yellowstone is in mostly Wyoming, a little bit of it is in Montana, and then Long Valley Caldera is on the eastern side of the Sierra Nevada in California. Now comparing these two calderas is kind of hard because technically Yellowstone is considered a super volcano, but on the basics of the three types of volcanoes, it is a, considered a caldera. So Long Valley Caldera is much smaller, but still over a very wide area. So it includes the Mammoth Lakes area up to Glass Mountain and Crowley Lake. So this is over in Owens Valley on the other side or the east side of the Sierra Nevada. Um, and then here you can see the outline of the Yellowstone. And this is just the park, okay? Um, so the caldera rim is here, but as you go into the earth, it's drastically bigger. So let's look at Yellowstone below the surface. So this is what Yellowstone actually looks like below the surface. So I give you kind of this to get you going. And then here you can see as we go down into the earth, it gets drastically bigger. So right here is the outline of the park. If you can see the outline of Yellowstone, and then this is the entire magma chamber here. Um, with seismic studies and looking at earthquakes, um, we've seen hot pockets that are not associated with the main plume for Yellowstone. 
um, which could form on the surface if they find their way all the way to the surface, or they could join the existing plume. Um, so this is very massive in comparison to what we actually see on Earth, even though on Earth it still seems huge on the surface, right? It's even bigger below the surface. So <clears throat> looking at ash fall, we can compare calderas to um, composite stratovolcanoes. So here's the Mount St. Helens volcano location and the ash fall associated with the 1980 eruption. Then we can look at Long Valley and we have one from, or a couple from Yellowstone. So you can tell that the ash fall that we see from composite stratovolcanoes is far less than what we see from calderas. So there's Mount St. Helens, Long Valley, Yellowstone. Looking at magma volume, here's another look at it. Lassen, 1915, this is in California. That was our latest eruption in California of a volcanic eruption. As last in 1915, this is how much lava was produced, the size of my pointer. <laughs> and then uh, we have Mount St. Helens, 1980, in this green here. And then, as you can tell, Yellowstone, Long Valley, Yellowstone, Yellowstone, Toba, Toba's in Japan. These are drastically larger than your composite stratovolcanoes. Lassen is also a composite stratovolcano. So in the western United States, we see quite a few volcanoes. They extend from northern California up into Oregon, Washington, and into Canada. And these are the Cascadian volcanoes. All right, so moving on from volcanoes, how else do we get igneous rocks? Another way is plutons. So when a volcano doesn't actually form at the surface and the magma chamber stays in place, and never escapes to the surface, it will slowly crystallize over time. If it slowly crystallizes over time, it has a chance to form very large crystals. So when we talk about igneous rocks, I'll talk about the different crystal sizes based on its formation. Um, but for now, think of a pluton as kind of a frozen magma chamber that has crystallized below the surface. So all the rocks are forming below the surface. So if I say it's a plutonic igneous rock, it formed below the surface. If I say it's volcanic igneous rocks, that means it formed from a volcano on the surface, okay? So if we have just one intrusion or one magma chamber that pushes its way up and crystallizes, we call that a pluton. Now, if we get a bunch of plutons or see a bunch of plutons form near each other, they form what we call a batholith. So a batholith is just a grouping of a bunch of different plutonic intrusions that have crystallized below ground, okay? And we have a lot of those in the West as well because we have so much volcanic activity, we also have plutonic activity. So we have the Sierra Nevada batholith, which you may be semi-familiar with because you know where the Sierra Nevadas are, right? Where Yosemite is. Yosemite is part of that batholith. There's the Idaho batholith, and there's the Coast Range Batholith in Canada. Okay, so Mount Whitney is part of this Batholith. This is a view of Mount Whitney here from the eastern side of the Sierra Nevada. I highly recommend checking that out. This is from probably around Bishop area, Bishop, California. Mount Whitney stands at 14,505 feet, and that is the tallest mountain uh, in the continuous United States. So that doesn't include Hawaii, or Alaska. Fresno Dome is another type of feature that we might see from one of these plutons. So as the pluton comes to the surface and hardens, oftentimes it, it forms kind of a dome because it looks kind of like a magma chamber, a sort of dome shape. And if that hardens over time and then is exposed at the surface from erosion, which we'll talk about in the next module a little bit more, um, it will form a nice dome like you see Fresno Dome. You're probably more familiar with Half Dome, um, but Half Dome is where erosion has started to take place a little bit more than on the Fresno Dome because Half Dome is only half of a dome now. Um, half Dome used to be a full dome, but after glacial erosion and landslides which and rock falls, which are pretty evident in this photograph, um, have removed half of its 
rock, so you only see half of the dome. Alright, and then in the next video we will talk about igneous rocks.